Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome once again to our Sunday service here at Donagh Free Church. Today, we're going to be seeing how ridiculous it is for anyone to make excuses for not coming to Jesus. So I hope that if you're a Christian and you are dealing with people who are making such excuses, that you will learn from our look at God's word today uh, how to address the excuses that are made. And I hope that if you yourself are making such excuses, that you will realise from our meditation this morning how utterly ridiculous it is for anyone to make any excuse for not coming to Jesus. As we worship God together this morning, let's bow before him in prayer. Lord God, we thank you for the privilege of being able to worship you. And we thank you that your word tells us that you have revealed your glory in creation so that mankind is without excuse. We pray today that as we read and reflect on your word, that your Holy Spirit would so bless it to us as to make sure that none of us will make any excuses at all for not accepting Christ. So be with us and apply your truth to our hearts by your Holy Spirit, that we might truly know in our own personal lives what it is to glorify and enjoy you as our God. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, boys and girls, we're going to be looking today at the subject of excuses. Uh, maybe uh, some of you don't know uh, what I'm talking about when I use that word, but I'm sure that others do. I'm sure that you often uh, make excuses when you do things that are wrong or not do things that you should do. When we go to school, uh, as you know, if we're absent, uh, teachers expect our parents to write a note explaining why we weren't in school or excusing ourselves for not having been in school. And uh, I was reading some of these the other day, and some of them are quite funny. Uh, for example, uh, one parent wrote, Please excuse Josh for not being in school. I forgot to wake him up, and I didn't find him until I started making the bets, and by then it was too late for him to go to school. And then uh, another parent wrote, uh, Please excuse Janet's absence from school. It was take your daughter to work day. Since I don't have a job, I made her stay at home and do the housework. And then another one said, eh, please excuse Mary for missing school yesterday. We forgot to get the Sunday paper off the porch and when we found it on Monday, we thought it was Sunday. So you get all sorts of excuses being made at times by parents for not eh, having their children in school. And uh, these excuses that I've just read are really quite ridiculous. Do you know that in the Bible, we're told that very often people make excuses for not believing in Jesus. And in our sermon this morning, we're going to see what some of these excuses are and why it's crazy not to come to Christ. Why it's really daft and silly, and stupid and ridiculous for anyone to make any excuse for not accepting Jesus. Now, I know that you're not daft, you're not silly, you're not stupid. And I know that you are wise, boys and girls, and I would hope that being wise, that you will not make any excuses for not coming to Jesus, but that you will show that you are wise by having already accepted Jesus as your Saviour and Lord. And I pray that together uh, we will come to know more and more of Jesus as we study his word today and over these weeks when we're not able to be together in church. Thank you once again for listening.
Our reading this morning is from Luke chapter 14. The the context is that Jesus has gone into, has been invited by a Pharisee to dine in his home. And there he, as he always does, shares the good news of the kingdom with those who are present. And as we take up the reading at verse 12, we're told that he said also to the man who had invited him, when you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbours, lest they also invite you in return and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed, because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. When one of those who reclined at table with him heard these things, he said to him, Blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. But he, that is Jesus, said to him, A man once gave a great banquet and invited many. And at the time for the banquet, he sent a servant to say to those who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said to him, I have bought a field and I must go out and see it. Please excuse me. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I'm going to examine them. Please excuse me. And another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So the servant came and reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house became angry and said to his servant, Go out quickly to the streets and lanes of the city, and bring in the poor and crippled and blind and lame. And the servant said, Sir, what you commanded has been done, and still there is room. And the master said to the servant, Go out to the highways and hedges, And compel people to come in, that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste my banquet. I want to focus this morning on words you find in verse 18. But they all alike began to make excuses. We've been looking recently at some of the invitations to come to Christ that we have in the Bible. And we've been seeing how important it is for us to ask him to come into our lives and how he is more willing to receive us than we often are to receive him. Jesus, very often in his ministry, used illustrations, stories, parables in order to impress various truths on the people whom he was addressing. And he uses several uh, illustrations relating to wedding feasts or banquets in order to get the truth across to all who would listen that provision has already been made by God for all our needs in Christ and that each and every one who hears about God's provision is more than welcome to come and to receive Jesus. And yet, the sad fact is that although all these things are true, many will not come. In our passage today, and in fact in our text today, we're told that they all alike began to make excuses. In a sense, although the excuses were different, they were all the same. And I want this morning to look with you at the reality behind the excuses the reasons that people give for not coming to Jesus and how ridiculous it is for anyone to excuse himself and herself for not accepting Christ. The first thing that needs to be said as we look at the reality behind the excuses is that these people who are mentioned here had no real desire to come to the feast None of the excuses stand up. The wealthy man, the man who had bought a field, said that he had to go and see it. Had he not seen it before buying it? And could he not see it again and again and again for the rest of his life? Any time he wanted, he could go and see it because now that he had bought it, it belonged to him. The working man, He had bought five yoke of oxen and says that he's going to examine them. 
would he not have examined them before buying them? And then the newlywed man. He might have quoted from Deuteronomy 24, verse 5, a verse that allowed people who were newly married to be excused from public duties for a whole year in order that they might enjoy the honeymoon period, so to speak, with their wives. Was he not depriving her of the opportunity to come and enjoy the banquet with him? And would he not have the rest of his life to enjoy his wife? The bottom line is that behind the excuses, there is this no real desire to come. Other things come first. Is that the way it is with you? Another thing that we can say is that behind the excuses people make for not coming to Jesus is that we don't want to be different. We don't want to stand out from the crowd. We don't want to be regarded as being different from everyone else. Maybe we go to church and we're quite happy to go to church. But to actually stand up for Christ means that even in church we are marked as people who are professing to know and love Jesus. And we don't want to be regarded as fanatical. We don't want to be different. We're just happy enough to, to go with the flow, but not come to Jesus. Do you know, the bottom line is that those who make excuses for not coming to Jesus are being duped by the devil. It's the devil who wants to keep us back when the invitations come to us. It's the devil who prevents us and who says to us that we don't even need to come to Christ. Sometimes the devil will say to us that what we're hearing is not true, that these wedding feasts that the Bible speaks of, that they're no more than just pie in the sky when you die, and that they ain't going to happen. And then the devil will maybe say to us, well, you can make it by yourself. You don't really need to go the way of Christ. The, the Bible tells us that to those who are perishing, the preaching of the cross of Christ is foolishness. The devil is blinding our eyes to reality and will do his utmost to ensure that we will not accept the gracious invitations that we have repeatedly in Scripture to come to Jesus. So the reality behind the excuses is that our desire to come is not as it ought to be. We may not want to be different to anyone else, and so we're afraid to stand up and be counted as being on the Lord's side, and we're allowing the devil to dupe us in relation to where we stand spiritually. But as we come to look at the parable itself, what are the reasons that people give for not coming to the feast. Well, in the parable, it's obvious that none of these men who are mentioned here thought that the time was right for them to come. In other words, it was inopportune. Too busy. As we look at the parable, the men invited were very busy. One was busy going to see his field. The other busy examining his five yoke of oxen, and the other is he enjoying his time with his wife. So caught up with these things and not willing to put time aside to come to the feast. You know, the Bible tells us that there are many who have room for pleasure, room for business, but no room for Jesus. Will a man rob God of the time that God has given him to come to him. Now is time accepted. We're to redeem the time. We're to make full use of the day of grace and of opportunity. Are we, are you too busy to come to Jesus? So caught up with other things as to have no time for Christ. So people won't come because they are too busy to come to Jesus. 
and then others won't come because they think it's too soon. They think that they're too young to come to Jesus. Many is a young person, perhaps you're among them, has put it off until a more convenient time. The truth of the matter is that every minute that we hold off is a minute wasted. How much more so every year that we hold back is a year wasted. The devil would tell us that there's plenty of time. God's word tells us that tomorrow is not promised. Jesus wants us to come to him when we're young. Let the little children come to me and do not put them off. The kingdom of God belongs to such as these. The sooner we come to Jesus, if we're spared, the longer we'll have to enjoy him in this world as we prepare to enjoy him in eternity. I remember when I was 17, talking to a Christian who told me that her biggest regret was that she hadn't come to Jesus when she was younger. I asked her, how old were you when you came to Jesus? And she said, I was 18. I then looked at her and said, oh, well, I've still got a year left then. And she said to me, you don't know if you've got a day left. And the amazing kindness of God, it was at the age of 18 that by his grace, I came to Jesus. And I began to understand then what she meant. You're not too soon. You're not too young to come to Christ. Don't put it off until you are older. And you know, that takes me to the next point. If we don't put the clock one way, we put it the other way. There are those who say, I'm too old or I'm too late to come to Jesus. I'm too far gone to come to Jesus. You're still on mercy's ground. This is still for you, no matter how old you are, no matter how late in the day you think it is. There is still time. The thief on the cross at the 11th hour, was found by Jesus and assured of a place in his kingdom. I knew of a woman in my own home village in Lewis who was 86 years of age and on her deathbed when through hearing the gospel over the radio she came to Jesus and told everyone about him in the weeks that remained before she passed away. Someone put it this way, while the lamp holds out to burn, the vilest sinner may return. The lamp is still holding out. It's not too late for you to come to Jesus. The Bible says we're to choose this day whom we will serve. So there are those who say it's inopportune, too busy, too soon, too late. Then there are those who say that it's inappropriate that they come to Jesus. There are some who think they're good enough as they are, who think that by their own merits, by their own works, the fact that they're respectable, the fact that they're religious, the fact that they're good living in that sense, they think their own goodness will suffice. The Bible tells us that all our goodness, all our righteousness, is as a filthy rug as far as God is concerned. If you could save yourself by your own goodness, why did Jesus come into the world to die on the cross? Are you perfect? If you're not perfect, then you are not good enough to make it on your own. But the good news of the gospel is that it's not the righteous but sinners, that Jesus came to save. No one is good enough to make it with God by himself or herself. But then, going to the other extreme, there are those who say, well, I know I'm not good enough. In fact, I'm far too bad, I'm far too much of a sinner to come to Jesus. The Bible tells us that he's able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him. The hymn writer says, the vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus, a pardon 
receives. The Apostle Paul says that he was the chief of sinners, and yet Christ saved him. The Bible says, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. The prodigal son wasn't too far gone to return home. His father was waiting for him and received him gladly, no matter how far gone in sin he had been. Then there are those who say, well, it's inappropriate for me to come to Jesus because I, I don't feel like it. They think that they have to feel something before they can come to Jesus. The Bible nowhere says that we're either saved or lost by the way we feel. I remember at the time of my own conversion saying this to someone who was helping me. And this person said to me, where in the Bible from Genesis to Revelation do you see anywhere written that we are saved or lost on account of the way we feel? The Bible is saying to us that it is by faith in Christ that we are made right with God. The Bible says that what we need is to be aware of the fact that we need Jesus and to be aware of the fact that Jesus has come to save those who are lost. It's not a matter of feeling anything. It's a matter of trust. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. It's the finished work of the cross that saves us, not whether we feel good or bad or feel nothing at all. Yes, feelings come and feelings go, but feelings can often be deceiving. Our trust is to be in Jesus. And then there are those who plead inability when it comes to making excuses. There are those who say, well, I can't come unless I'm one of the chosen. That's really fatalism. If you get a, an invitation to a wedding, are you going to then wonder if the person who gave you the invitation wants you to come or not? And are you going to, as it were, seek to creep into that person's house to delve into their, their secret documents just in case there's something there that says, well, I sent an invitation to him or her, but I really hope that he or she doesn't come. Of course, you're not going to do that. To act like that would be to insult the person who sent you the invitation. Now, I know that sometimes, humanly speaking, people do send out lots of invitations to weddings and, and they sometimes, if the truth be told, hope that not everybody will accept because if they will, then they'll wonder how they'll be able to cope. But God's not like that. When God sends out the invitation, he means it. And in fact, in our parable today, Jesus makes clear that there is room for everyone who will accept the invitation. God isn't, as it were, you're playing a game with us. God isn't mocking us. The secret things are known to God. The revealed things are made clear to us. And what is made clear here is that we are being invited. The doctrine of election or God's uh, choosing his people is found in Scripture to encourage the believer never to excuse unbelief. In fact, uh, Don McLeod has recently uh, written a book on this very subject called Compel Them to Come In. Uh, and in that book, he deals decisively with all the excuses that people make, especially in relation to election and uh, other such doctrines for not coming to Jesus. But they say, well, I can't come by myself. It's not really a case of I can't come, but I won't come. And then people say, I can't change myself or by myself. The Bible says that God changes us. <laughs> the change is brought about by God. And what we certainly can't do, he is more than able to do for us. And there are those who say, well, I can't become perfect overnight. Nobody's asking you to become perfect overnight. 
The Bible makes clear that when God works, he begins a work that will ultimately end up in us being like Christ. But the work is his, and nobody is being asked to make themselves perfect overnight. And if anyone thinks that he or she has attained to perfection in this life, then he or she is sincere, yes, but certainly deluded. And then there are those who say, well, if, even if I do come, I can't keep it up. It's the grace of God that saves us, and it's the grace of God that enables us to keep it up, to keep on going, to persevere, and to live in a way that is pleasing to God. So these are some of the reasons people give. It's inopportune. It's inappropriate. Or they plead their own inability. Before we move on to look quickly at the last point, maybe you're saying, well, none of the reasons or none of the excuses that I make have been mentioned. Maybe they haven't. But can I ask you, will your excuse, if it's not been mentioned in this sermon, stand when you appear before God? The answer to that question is very simple. No, it will not. Because to make excuses for not coming to the feast is quite ridiculous. It's not only foolish, but it's also fatal. Why? Well, first of all, it's God we're dealing with. God is the one who has made the provision. God is the one who has prepared the banquet. God is the one who, through his servants, invites us to come. God is the one who says that there is still room. And God also says that ultimately the house is going to be filled. Every place will be taken up. The offer is extended to you today to come. How ridiculous it is to refuse that offer. Foolish and fatal. How will our excuses look on the day of judgment? We'll remember the excuses that we made and we'll be full of regret and remorse. Then it will be too late to repent. You see, our eternal destinies are at stake. Why run the risk of a lost eternity, of being cast out, of being among those who were invited but who will not taste of the banquet. Are you too active to accept the invitation today? Too busy to bother? Too worldly to want to come? Too proud to partake of what he has provided for you? How sad that is when he is today asking you to put all your excuses aside and to come to the feast. Come, ye needy, come and welcome. God's free bounty glorify. Through belief and through repentance, every grace that brings us nigh. Without money, without money, come to Jesus Christ and buy. Let not conscience make you linger, nor of fitness fondly dream. All the fitness he requireth is to feel your need of him. This he gives you, this he gives you, tis the Spirit's rising beam. Come ye weary, heavy laden, lost and ruined by the fall. If you tarry till you're better, you will never come at all. Not the righteous, not the righteous, sinners Jesus came to call. Will you, like the rest, begin and continue to make your excuse. Lord, bless these solemn thoughts and your word to us. And grant that we might all realise that we're without excuse before God. In Jesus' name, Amen. Yeah.
service to a close this morning, we would bring before you the, the needs of others. We, we pray especially for those who have spiritual and eternal needs that have not yet been met. And we ask that by your grace that you would make yourself known and precious to all such who have been listening today and to many more besides. And at this time when we're uh, still in the midst of you know, the you know, unprecedented uh, COVID-19 crisis, we bring before you all who have suffered the loss of loved ones, all who have been unwell and are still unwell, we bring before you and we pray for all doctors and nurses and carers and all who are involved in seeking to alleviate the many, full, many needs that we're aware of that so many people have. We commit to you our own congregation we ask that you would uh, draw near to those who need you in a particular way today uh, as a result of their own personal circumstances. And we ask that you would remember uh, the preaching of the gospel as it has gone forth across the world. May it be used of you to bring many to yourself. We commit uh, all matters into your hands uh, and we thank you that you have the whole world in your hands uh, and that there is nothing 
uh, that you're unaware of, whilst at the same time uh, we are being asked to cast our tears upon you, knowing that you care for us. So hear us, Lord, not only in relation to the things that we have asked for audibly, but also to the many other uh, unspoken uh, prayers of intercession that arise from our hearts at this time. Follow uh, our uh, efforts today with your blessing, and may your grace, your mercy, and your peace be with us all, now and eternally. Amen.